today that we're sharing, my prayer is that it speaks to individual hearts here in such a way that that maybe that the Holy Spirit would use these words in your heart if you do not know Jesus, if you no, don't have a relationship with Jesus. And so this is what it's about. Um, but it's also an opportunity for those that you have you years ago have made a decision for Jesus to follow him. It's a reminder of where you've been as well and where... Well, what you could share with others that may not know him, people that are in your life, your friends. A scripture from Galatians chapter 3, this is a living Bible, and you may have it a little more understandable, but it's very clear concerning the gospel and our salvation. For now we are all children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And we who have been baptized into union with Christ as enveloped by him. We are no longer Jews or Gentiles or slaves or free men or merely men or women. But we are all the same. We are Christians. We are one in Jesus Christ. It's Jesus himself who came, who gave his life for us. But the one question that many people ask throughout their life, at least one that is so often there, many people, they live their entire lives without ever knowing why. They exist from year to year with no idea why they live or what's God's purpose in their lives. And, of course, the, reg the question is, hey, well, what's the meaning of my life? What... What's it all about? Why, why am I here? <laughs> now, some people try to, to uh, figure that out and try to find the reason or, or who they are by different areas. Some look for happiness in acquiring possessions. They fulfill those things. They've got that empty spot in their life, and they want to have a happiness. They want to have a joy. They want to... They want to be different, so what do they do? They acquire things to try to supply that emptiness that is there, that, but that doesn't work. Others try to find happiness by the experiencing pleasure. Well, I mean, even you can run the gamut for that one. It's not just the, the type of going from party to party and just to have a good old time but even can lead down the road to addiction and other things as well, whether it be sexual or alcohol or whatever, just so I can experience some type of pleasure, fulfill that empty spot in the, in, in the life, to answer, try to answer the question, well, what, what's my purpose here? What am I here? Another one, look for happiness and gaining prestige and power. You know, if I, I'm, I'm in the right position, I get in the right position, I, I run for office, I get in the pl place of, of position of power and authority, I'm looked up to, there are those that would go after their, their individual education, they seek after that so they can have the degree on the wall and have a place of prestige, and you know, look at my degrees all with the idea of, of trying to define what, who they are and what's the meaning of my life. It doesn't happen. However, real happiness only comes from understanding what? My purpose here. Why am I here? Why do I exist? And so that's the question. What's my existence? Why am I here? Well, there's, there's several area, or a couple of areas that I'd like us to consider here. The first area is this, that God made you, made me, to love this. That's kind of what Julia mentioned here. Why did God create us? Why did God make us 
He does it out of love. He does it because he has compassion, because he wants to express that love. And so he creates us, he makes us, he wants to give us life. A couple of scriptures here. Jeremiah 31, 3, God says, I love you with an everlasting love. Everlasting. It's just not for now. Isaiah 43, 4 says, you are precious to me and honored and I love you. We looked at this in their study of Ephesians when we were there. Uh, Ephesians 1, 4, and 5. Long ago, even before he made the world, God chose us to be his very own. Through what Christ did for us. He decided then to make us holy in his eyes without single fault. We who stand before him covered in his love. God saw you, picked you out, and says, I love you. We exist. We are who we are. Why am I here? God loves you. That's why you're here. The other area is that, that we were created to enjoy a personal relationship with God and to use all the other things in, in God's creation. There is, it is very clear, going back to Adam and Eve in the garden, their experience with God, they were created and they had experience with God. In fact, the Scripture says that they walked with God in the cool of the day. They had this relationship. God creates us to enjoy a relationship with Him, but also He's given us a responsibility as we may, of stewardship, of having control, having dominion. A couple of scriptures. Genesis 1, 27 and 28. God created human beings, making them in His image. He blessed them and said, live all over the earth and bring it under control. I am putting you in charge. God creates us. He makes us in his image. We're the highest of all creation. And we're to be like God in that sense. Because God gives us stewardship over everything to enjoy. A lot of the things that we do have that God has given us, we don't really enjoy them. We take them for granted. We just say that's just the way things are. And yet God continues to give it. 1 Timothy 3, uh, 6, 7, God richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Jesus said, I come in order that you may have life and have it to the full. That's why he came. So we can enjoy the relationship with God that we can know and recognize that he loves us. And the proof of that love is Jesus coming. Jesus says, here I've come to give and pour into your life so that you could enjoy. You have responsibility. I want to be in a relationship with you. third area that I want us to realize that when we know and love God and live in harmony with His purposes for our lives, there's tremendous benefits for that. And I, there's a list. Some of them coming from Romans chapter 8, some from Philippians. I'm pretty sure that some of you even know some of the Scripture that goes along with it. The benefits of being in relationship to God through Jesus Christ, one of those, there's a whole list there. I list those. Clear conscience. Man, I can stand before God with a clear conscience. No regrets. And know that He knows me. And I can be in relationship with Him. I can have life and peace because of the relationship with Jesus. Wife, 
eternal life. If you believe in Jesus and follow Him, you know Him, you can know that you have eternal life, life and peace. You know purpose in your life. It's the, you're not just something random. There's, there's something for you to do, for you to accomplish. Romans 8, 28 is probably one that you could probably quote, that God works everything out for good to them that are called, to them that are called according to His purpose. Those He foreknew, He became so that you would be conformed to the image of His Son. That's purpose. There's purpose for everything, and you know. There's confidence, there's hope. There's not just a hope so, there's a confidence in who God is. There's security in knowing that He holds us in the palm of His hand. There's strength and power. And you guys know this verse, right? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's in relationship with Jesus. So that the things we go through, the context of those verses, have to do with Paul talking about the things that he's going through in his life. I've got a lot. I've got less. I've been both directions. I've been in prison. I've been free. He says, in all things I've learned to be content, for I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's in relationship with Jesus. Fulfillment. Freedom. Those who, son, who the Son sets free is free indeed. Freedom. That's in Jesus. Rome, uh, John chapter 8. That's the kind of lifestyle that God intends for us to have. But there's a problem, isn't it? I mean, we still need to grow. We understand that. Maybe you're a follower of Jesus. You made that commitment. And you need to grow in these areas in relationship to Jesus. But why is it that there are so many people that are so unhappy? Does not really enjoy these things in relationship? What's, what's the problem? What's the problem here? Let me point out one. People have a natural inclination to be boss and to ignore God's principles for living. I'm my own boss. That's some of the things that we hear said. You know, I'm looking out for number one. Right? I want to do my own thing. If it feels good, do it. I don't care what God says. As long as it feels good. It's my life and I'll do what I please. And that's generally what people think. That's why they're so, because they're not in relationship with God, I want to be my own boss. I want to, I don't want God wants me to do what God wants me to do. When our relationship with God isn't right, it causes problems in every area of our lives. When our relationship with God, and we've been talking about that, loving God, loving people. When our love and relationship with God is out, it affects every area of our lives. It affects me. I mean, there's no one here perfect, right? But the point is, is that if I'm standing and I'm saying I'm boss of my life, that affects my relationship with God, right? So because of that relationship with God is messed up, it's going to affect every area of our lives. Our marriage, family, career, relation, other relationships, finances, everything is touched by that because I'm boss instead of Jesus, instead of God. And let me say, if you're a follower of Jesus, that also affects every area of your life. It should. If I, if I profess to be a follower of Jesus, it should affect marriage, family, career, relationships, your finances and how you give, how you don't give, how you, whatever, how you manage your finances. It should affect that. It should touch that. It should affect that because we say we're following Jesus and therefore, Lord, what do you want? I'm not the boss anymore. When people have problems, they often try different ways of coping before they turn to God. 
Proverbs 16.25, there is a way that seems right unto humans, but only end in death. You think we have our own way. We do our own thing. I am my own boss, and I try to try to figure it all out, what this relationship's all about. So why is it that even when we're at the deepest need is God himself, we try so many other ways to get to know him? Or at least we think we do when we get to know him. All right? Why is it that we know in our heart our deepest need is God and relationship with Jesus? And that's our deepest need. Why is it that we try so many other things? You know, here, here, here's some things that I've heard people say. One of them says, well, my mother was a Christian, so that must mean, you know, well, she had a relationship with God, so therefore I got one, Right? You know, some of you probably could, could say, well, my grandparents, they, they were really church-going people, you know, and they've read the Bible, and they've, they, it was open about their faith, right? Oh, because they were there, you know, I, I am too. I get the, I get it by osmosis, I guess, you know. That's the idea. It just pours over on me, so I'm in there. How about this one? It doesn't matter what I believe you believe, just be sincere. Think about that one. As long as I'm sincere, everything is going to be great. I'm going to make it to heaven. I'm not going to do it. I mean, I'm going to have this relationship with God just because I'm sincere. Hey, ever tried getting on a okay, let's let's say you're going on a on a on a train and you're you want to go to New York City, right? Your ticket says New York City, but you sincerely want to go to New York City, right? But you end up on a train going south to Washington, D.C., but you're sincere, right? You ain't getting to New York City. You're going to end up in D.C. You understand what I'm saying? You can be all the sincere, have all the sincerity in your life about whatever it is. But that's not going to make it. It's the end of the destination that's important, right? Sincerity is just, it's not enough. How about this one? I'll work real hard and I'll earn it. I'm going to earn this relationship. I, we've had scripture on that already. It's not by the things that we do. But there are those that, that, that they do so many things so much stuff in order to earn the relationship. They think they have to do in order to get in good with God. And that pours over to that, uh, you know, I'll be religious, I'll go to church. I, I don't know how many people say that. I'll get my life straight now, I'll go to church. I'm going to go to church. And that'll prove that to God that that's, uh, that's what it's all about. And the point is, is that, hey, no, it doesn't solve it doesn't solve it at all. It, it doesn't get you into relationship with God through Jesus. No matter how hard you work or how sincere you are, or because your parents or grandparents were in there, they were believers in Jesus, it has nothing to do with those things because it's relationship that we're talking about. So let's talk about the solution. What's the solution to this dilemma that we're in? Okay, what's the solution? This is what Jesus said. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's not by sincerity or going to church or anything else that you might do. I'll work hard at it, try to be good. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. Now, some people take that, isn't Jesus being really narrow there? I mean, he's saying, well, come on, you know, and, you know, it's only through me that you can be saved, that you can, you can have a relationship with, with the Father through him. It's only that way. Isn't that pretty narrow? Well, maybe you're thinking that way. And maybe you've heard people say that. Well, Jesus says he's the only way. You know, come on. 
you know, the idea of the there's a wide gate and a narrow gate, and there's the narrow gate. I mean, isn't that exclusive? That isn't that isn't that harsh? Well, just let me let me use an illustration that even Jesus uses. Jesus said one day he was with with his his disciple or his disciples, and also in the having a, a party of 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 people that were looked down upon. They were publicans. They were tax collectors, if you will. And Matthew had invited him to his home to meet his friends, Jesus to meet his friends, people that he hung out with. And there was some question, well, well Jesus, why are you and your disciples hanging out with these people? And Jesus said, this is what he said. He said, those that are sick need a physician, but those that don't, don't need it. He said, those that are righteous, I've come to call sinners to repentance. I didn't call the righteous. So here's the illustration. You go to the doctor and you've got, you're ill. Maybe some of you have had flu, cold, whatever. And you go to the doctor and the doctor prescribes some medicine. Now, are you going to tell the doctor... Well, Doc, Doc, you know, why are you so narrow? Why do I have to take that medicine? Do you? You don't do that, do you? Why? Because the medicine's the cure for your sickness. You take it. Because you know that that medicine is going to make you well. You don't argue with the doctor and say, Do doc, doc, you know, you know, there's a lot of other medicines out there. Right? There's a lot of other ones that way. Uh, why don't I take this one for a headache? And he don't even have a headache, but you can take it. You know, I, what about that one? To solve the, the sickness? No. You, you, we don't even argue that way. So when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and life, no man comes to the Father but through me, that he has come to call those that are sinning to repentance to have a changed life, he's the only way. And if you're sick in sin, he's the answer. He's salvation. God himself came to earth as a human being to bring us back to himself. If any other way would work, Jesus would not have come, and he alone is the way. Think about that one. If any of those things list I listed earlier worked, Jesus would not have come to bring us to God, His Father, in love. It would be unnecessary. Because if I can work hard enough to make it, Jesus didn't have to do that. He didn't have to come and take my sin. He didn't have to do that. Understand? Romans 6.23, and some of you probably can quote this one, for the wages of sin is death, but... The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. There's a gap there. The payment for sin, death, die. Separation from God at forever. We're not talking, in this case, necessarily just physical death. But God's gift is eternal life, and he offers it. God did this for us because he loves us and wants us to know him. He wants us to have a relationship with him. He desires relationship. That's why he made us and created us. Romans 5.8, God demonstrates his love for us in while we were still separated or sinners from God by sin.
Christ died for us, for you, for me. Even when we're at our worst, even when we're, we think we could do it ourselves, when we're our own boss, Jesus still, God still demonstrated his love towards us because Jesus died. This is a living Bible. It's uh, 1 Timothy 2.5. And I think it makes it very clear about this relationship of Jesus. God is on one side and all people are on the other side. And Christ is between, between them to bring them together by giving his life for all mankind. Got the image? One side, God. One side, mankind and in between to bring them together is Jesus who dies for us and rises again from the dead the King James uses the word term mediator he is the mediator between ourselves and God and he brings us together God's already done his part He's taking the initiative. He's taking the first step. And when we learn how God restores him to himself, we need to do something. We need to respond. And so what do you do? What's your response? What does God want me to do? What does God want you to do in response to what Jesus has done? Here it is. Admit that God has had first place, had not has had first place in your life, and ask Him to forgive you for ignoring Him. Admit it. You've, you've, you've lived your life away from God. You're, you're, you say, you've said, I'm my own boss. I'm running my own life. Admitting that you've gone through your life and ignored God. And He's not there. He's not number one. Life, if you will, think of your life as a pyramid. At the base of the pyramid, you start filling in the blocks. As you go up the pyramid, that pinnacle that point, what do you put there? What do you put in that point in your life? And I'm not locked looking for the religious answer there, like it's God. All right? That's a religious answer. They, that's automatic um, for many of you. Oh, yeah, God. It's got to be Jesus, right? But I know unless we admit that God isn't the first place in our lives and we've been ignoring Him throughout our lives, we need to admit that. We need to admit it to Him. To Him. Sin is choosing to ignore God and His ways. 1 John 1, 9, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from every wrong. And I say amen to that. Secondly, it's not just admitting, but also believing. Believing. What do you believe? He rose again from the dead and is alive today. Do you believe Jesus rose from the grave? Do you believe that? Because that affects every area of your life. If you truly hold that belief in your core of you, and I say that to myself as well. You see, admitting but believing that he's alive. He rose from the dead. So the stuff that happens in your life, <laughs> label that, put that over, the resurrection of Jesus over whatever situation that you're in. Believing that he rose from the dead and he's alive today. Thirdly, oh, let me quote 10, Romans 10, 9. If we confess 
that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The heart, the mouth. Peter, in preaching one, one day before a, a religious group, this is what he said, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name but Jesus by which you must be saved. It's only through Jesus. He is the only Savior of our lives. And thirdly, we need to accept God's free gift of salvation. You can't earn it, so don't try. <laughs> you can't do it. You accept it? You believe it? Do you believe it? Do you receive it? This gift. I've used this illustration before. Suppose you were given, given a gift at Christmas time. It's all wrapped up really nice. It's under the tree. What do you do with that gift? Do you just sit there and admire the wrappings? And go, oh, that's a beautiful Christmas present. It's so nice that, that, that whoever gave it to us. You know, you just like the ribbon. Isn't that so pretty and so forth? It's not until you take the wrapper off that it becomes yours. I mean, it's yours under the tree. It's, it's got your name on it. But it's not until you unwrap it. You make it yours. You accept it. You receive it. Hey, it, now it's yours. Same way with the gift of eternal life that God offers through Jesus. Through Jesus. Admit, believe, accept, receive it, receive it. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for it is by grace you've been saved through faith, and this, not from yourself, it's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Our relationship with God is, is not restored by anything we do. We are made right with God solely on the basis of what Jesus has already done. It's not what we did or do. It's what he has already accomplished. He's already done. So here's my thought for you to bring it right down to where we're, we're living today. If, if you... Admit, believe, accept Jesus. Those three things. Today you can have a relationship with God, the Father, through Jesus Christ. Truth. If you believe, you, accept, you admit, you believe, you accept, you accept the gift that God has offered through Jesus, eternal life, you believe it's not by your doing, it's by what he has done. If you believe that and you, in your own heart, today you can have a relationship with the Father through Jesus Christ and know you have eternal life. And know that you have eternal life. And the promise of heaven and a hope for the future that's beyond this life.